My name is Lance Conrad, and I'm an author. I write books for a living. I went from crawling to sprinting. Now I could run through not just one world, but many. Live not just one life, but hundreds. He wants to marry her. He'll have to come to Tetuan. How about a nice spoiled cousin who bullies him all the time, right? What if these two characters fell in love? What if these two characters fought to the death? Show me him standing up against an entire army single-handed and throw most of the race before hopping out to run the last one. That's a little bit different. True story, by the way. Somebody went on a trip or somebody came to town. There's your plots. I took that big old forehead and just crashed every brick, board, and brother in the house. Let me tell you a story. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tell Me a Story. As you know, on the first Thursday, uh, we do Tell Me a Story where we interview someone who is, let's just say, especially interesting. And today we have Michael Brinkerhoff. Uh, thank you, Michael, uh, for joining us. Now, we are doing something different tonight. As you might have noticed, we started just a little bit late. That is because we are trying something new and exciting. Uh, we have Michael joining us from California. Uh, if this works well, we will be able to have guests from all over. So th this is a nice advancement. And Michael, I've noticed you've already got multiple friends in the chat who are incredibly excited to see you. Uh, I'm also very excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. Now, you're joining us. It, it has. Uh, yeah, Michael and I go way back. Uh, but where I stayed where I was, he has gone and traveled the nation in his linguistic pursuits. Uh, at least, uh, let's see, it was North Carolina, then California, wasn't it? So at least coast to coast. And what took you to California? So I, I can still hear you, but apparently, uh, oh, yep, looks like people are having trouble hearing Michael. All right, uh, everybody hold on just a minute. Like I said, we're trying something new here, and looks like we're having some trouble with the audio. Uh, so to catch up, everybody, because I can actually still hear him fine. Uh, and Mike, if you don't mind, I'm going to fill in just a little bit while they figure out the audio. Um. So Mike is currently in California finishing up his doctorate in linguistics. Um, now, I just have to say this because it's been on my mind. You're going to be Dr. Brinkerhoff. Correct. And you got this magnificent beard and the bald head going on. Yeah, I'm not saying you middle. shouldn't. I'm not saying you shouldn't pursue linguistics, but have you ever considered supervillain? Because Dr. Brinkerhoff, uh, I, I think that'd be pretty epic. Well, maybe one of these days. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Okay. Uh, we are good to go again. Um, now, so you are very nearly Dr. Brinkerhoff, a doctor of linguistics. Well, in like three years. but ah, Considering how long that path is, that's almost there. Uh, oh, looks, now, looks like my wife could hear me, but other say, people can't, so. Uh, people in the chat, I'm hearing that there is is sound. Uh, by, the, by the way, your wife has chimed in on the chat and informed us that she is completely down for you to follow the supervillain path. <laughs> uh, so we've got one vote for supervillain. There we go. That's now, all it needs, right? Let's jump in to linguistics sounds now, good first thing i want to take on of course is the stereotypes right yes now generally speaking i think that when people hear linguist what they hear is translator because almost every uh movie or tv show i have where they bring in a ling a linguist this is the person who somehow knows 
all the languages. <laughs> right? Even languages That'd be like a little alien hard. languages. Yeah, that they somehow know all the languages. So, could you first start us out just kind of a, a foundation? What does a linguist actually do if they're not busy learning, again, all the languages? Well, first off, I'm going to say that it would be really hard to learn all the languages on Are Earth. there a lot of them you're saying? Well, More than 10? Let's say that we're in the thousands. In the there, thousands. There are, according to current estimates, about 65 to 7,000 languages spoken on the planet Earth. So these are spoken languages, not just languages we know of. Correct. Nearly um, 7,000. Correct. As far as documented languages go, we probably only have maybe... 10% of those languages actually documented or less 10%. Yeah. 10% So there's or less. like 6,300 languages that people are probably speaking. We just don't even know about it. Correct. And every day they're dying. So, uh, most of those the languages, people, the languages are both, um, both. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So there's, there's a little bit of, uh, both going on there, but, um, for the most part, most languages um, have fewer than um, fewer than a thousand speakers. Wow! Uh, so, for example, there's some indigenous languages in the America that only have one speaker left. Oh wow! So, is this so. what linguists do? Do they go and they do they try to save these dying languages? Well, that's what some do. Um, so. As a general thing, linguists are concerned with the study of language and the science behind it. Um, so what is it that makes it possible for us as a species to speak a language? What are the biomechanical components that allow us to speak a language? Um, whether that's physical, whether that's cognitive, all sorts of things. Um, that's what a linguist does. Um, now, within linguistics, there's a lot of different subfields. Um, there are some which are called field linguists who go out and document languages. So those, those are the ones do. that are going to try to rescue those dying languages so they don't just disappear entirely. Correct. Correct. And um, the term that we like to use is going dormant instead of dying. Um, because there's always a chance that a language could be brought back from extinction. Okay. Are there records of that happening? Was there a language that nearly died and we, we resurrected it? Uh, well, there's actually quite a few languages that have completely died out, meaning that they're, they are no longer being taught to children. Um, for example, Hebrew is the prime example of this. Um, Hebrew was not spoken for over 2,000 years before, well, roughly 2,000 years uh, before it was brought back as a spoken language in the early 1900s um, in Israel. Well, so let me ask, let me ask this. How do we know or can we know? I guess you're the right person to ask. Can we really know that our pronunciation is correct on a language that's you know, thousands of years or over a thousand years dead, like Latin, for instance, I've heard people say, all right, well, we have these, but do, do we really know that it was spoken like that? How, how can we know this? So there's a few different ways that we're able to figure that out. Um, so for example, one thing that we do is we look at a lot of languages that are descendant from that language and we can recreate a close approximation of what we think that language sounded like. Um, and we could do this with languages that go back to about 3000 BC. 3000 BC? Mm hmm. There's um, one language, uh, well, language family called Indo European that we have, as linguists, have reconstructed quite extensively. Um, and we have a rough approximation of what it sounded like. Um, and we actually have people who created stories in this language and you could actually hear recordings of it um, by people who speak it 
well, people who study it as a profession. So these are people who have studied a language that's been gone for what, over 4,000 years, 5,000 years? How, how would you call that? I would say hasn't actively been spoken in 5,000 years. And they have, they have studied it, figured it out, and got to the point where they could actually tell stories in that language? Yep. Wow. All right, so... I'm just sorting through the flavors of linguists in my head. So we have the field linguists who are out there trying to gather data and trying to save some of the the, the sleeping languages, or I, I I think of them as dying, right? Yeah. Uh, but then we have what I'm going to call the uh, the paleontologist linguists, yep. uh, who are re rebuilding. Uh, yep. What else is there? So. The paleontologists that you're talking of, uh, they're called historical linguists or historical linguists. I like it. Yep. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, other flavors of linguists are phonologists, uh, which is what I am. Um, I'm a phonologist and a field I, I linguist. Was leaning, I was <laughs> leaning towards that is, yes. is what flavor are you? Yeah. So I am a phonologist and syntactician, um, and I also do field work. Um, so for those who aren't in the know, um, phonology is about the study of sounds and how they are represented in our cognitive system. So in our mental representation, um, a syntactician is someone who studies word order and how we put sentences together. Um, so that's what I do. Okay. All right. Um, and you, you've got three more years to become a, a master syntactician? I would actually say master phonologist first. Um, I'm a phonologist first, syntactician second. Nice. All right. Um, now, I, I'm going to circle back. Uh, I, I'm a little bit out of order on the questions I was planning to no worries. ask here, but I, I do have to wonder, what is what what does success look like to you like are there heroes in this field like ah oh, yes jerry he is the greatest phonologist who's ever spoken on the earth or whatever like are, yes. are there are there yes, those there things are. in the linguist world nice yes, there do, are. do you have a hero linguist i do um and i must hear I, about this i luckily uh, work with her um, she is my advisor here at Santa Cruz. Um, her name is Junko Ito, and she is considered the world's foremost expert on the interaction of phonology and syntax um, and how those two interact with each other. Uh, say, say the name one more time. Junko Ito. Junko Ito. The, mm -hmm. So we, we have our first linguist hero. Yep. All right. I like it. I, I got to say, if you go the whole supervillain route, this would be a great thing for, you know, <laughs> teacher versus student later on. If you two have a, a big conflict about some phoneme and end up, you know, coming to blows on it later, I, I'm just saying. we got some good backstory stuff here. So far. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, all right. So, yeah, what what does success look like for you? Like, how will you know when you have made it? Ooh, that's a really good question. I Thank think you. for <laughs> I think for me, success will be being in a tenured position um, at a university teaching. Um, teaching is one of my favorite things to do. I love sitting there with students who have no clue what's what linguistics is, and be able to explain it to them and be able to help open up their mind to the possibilities of what language can do and what we've been able to find about the commonalities between all languages. Now, I imagine it's, it's a lot like the field of history where a, a lot of linguists are heading towards teaching. Um, I guess mm -hmm. one of my questions would be a linguist that isn't headed the university route, what do they do? Are there like so, linguistic think tanks out there? Um, yes, actually. Uh, Google has one. Um, Amazon has one as well. Wow. Um, Cisco has one. So a lot of these big tech companies actually hire linguists 
to be able to process human language. Um, and, you know, we, a lot of us linguists, especially nowadays, the younger generation, uh, we're also proficient in computer programming um, as a way to be able to model human language and create artificial language experiments uh, to test what are the possibilities of language. Wow, I, I, I got to admit, I got to take a moment and kind of process that. Uh, so you, you have linguists going into the, or not just, just the corporate linguists, but you also have, which before, you know, two minutes ago, I had no idea that there were corporate linguists. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you also have linguists using computer modeling to, I, I guess, what, what does that look like when you say test the the limits or the possibilities of language, what would that even look like? So for example, um, one of my professors at UNC, uh, University of North Carolina um, at Chapel Hill, um, that's one of the things he does is he creates experiments to test how people learn language and to test, um, especially from the phonological side. So how is it that we are able to take an infinite number of potential forms that a word could take, and how are we able to order um, certain constraining factors in order to arrive at the correct outcome? And this is something that he models with language, with computer programming. Like for example, he creates this experiment where the computer is given like a bunch of words and it and the computer knows absolutely nothing and then he runs it through 10,000 100,000 trials to produce human like learning behavior and say okay if i'm able to reproduce this on a computer there is some merit that maybe this is also how humans are actually acquiring language say that this is sounding a lot like ai mhm mm yep we're talking um, about machine learning here we're we're teaching machines language in a sense, we're teaching machines how to understand language, um, in a sense, how to process language. Um, that's what a lot of the people at Google and Amazon are working on are AI systems. So working with Alexa, working with Siri, um, Siri like Apple also has them, um, Siri, Google Home, as a way to, you know, when we speak into these machines, they're able to process that audio because all what it is is sound waves in the air. It's able to take those sound waves, compute it, and turn it into an electrical signal, send it to its uh, servers, and then turn around and send it back to us um, as a message saying, oh, did you mean this? Did you mean that? And then they, the machines learn. And so that's something that we linguists help programmers understand um, that learning behavior. Um, and stuff like that. Just saying the whole supervillain linguist thing is just getting stronger and stronger <laughs> now that you're teaching the machines how, how to understand human speech. Uh, now, <laughs> let me ask you this. Would it be possible, uh, let, let's assume it's a really powerful AI, how much language could, under, could it learn if it didn't know it in the first place? Like if it didn't have active feeding, are there just patterns it could pick up on? Sorry, um, that, that might be a little bit over technical. It's an area that I'm not very well versed in, um, so I can't actually speak to that. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let's let's veer into what you are big into. What would you say is your primary focus in linguistics? We already talked about the the, the categories, right? The syntactician mm -hmm. and the pho phony. I, Phonologist. Phonologist. Okay, phonology. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but I imagine even those are entire fields. You've got to have a specialty, right? Yep. Uh, Excellent. Most, Tell me about that. So my specialty um, is looking into pronouns. Um, I look at pronouns, how they behave in both the syntactic system and the phonological system, and whether or not there are factors 
at work in either one of those spheres that are driving where those things are, where pronouns are pronounced, um, what forms the pronouns take. Um, another area I work on is tone. Uh, so some languages actually use variations in pitch to convey meaning of a word. A classic example is Chinese, how, you know, there's one syllable, ma, spoken in with five different pitches, um, conveys five different words. And so that's another area that I study. Um, third area is something known as the syntax prosody interface. So how the syntactic structure, um, because there's these mental trees in our head, um, how those correspond to spoken categories uh, that we call phonological categories. Okay. I'll claim that I understood about half of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a lot. So... I'm sorry. <laughs> if anyone questions me on it, you, you back me up and say that I understood at least half of it. Um, yes. And, and I, I knew that when we brought on a specialist that there'd be some of that. Um, but uh, I want to bring it back to the pronouns just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, that there's something that I have noticed with various languages because I, I love languages, right? Mm -hmm. I love hearing about them, love learning about them. Uh, and so I'm a huge fan of languages. Uh, that's why I just light up when I heard I could talk to a linguist. Um, <laughs> One thing I've noticed is that, you know, you, you were talking about pronouns. Most languages that I know about, they're almost always, at least the uh, the first person is always just like a single sound. Mm -hmm. Is that widespread or does that just happen to be the ones that I ran into? So it could just be the ones that you ran into. Um, I know there are some cases where um, – the pronoun you're referring to is the first person singular. So I in English, um, there are a few cases where it is um, larger uh, than just a single sound, um, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, I mostly focus on the way pronouns behave in a few different languages. Well, a few different language families. Now, we already discussed that linguists are not the people who know all the languages, but does it help to, to have one or two languages under your belt? It does. It helps out a lot. Um, so, for example, I speak English and German, um, and I also studied Old Norse or Old Icelandic, depending on who you ask. Um, and I also study um, indigenous language in Oaxaca, Mexico called Zapotec. Um, and so I kind of focus my study on the Germanic family. So uh, German, English, Icelandic, uh, the Scandinavian languages, German. Um, and then I also do a lot of work with Celtic and the languages of Mesoamerica. Okay. Well, to me, that seems like a whole heck of a lot. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I, I've never heard of Zapotec before. How many, how many speakers are there of that language? Is this one of the dying ones or just one that I haven't run across? So when we say Zapotec, um, there's actually 50 different Zapotec languages. So this is a language family? Yes or, or no. It's, it's, called, it's a macro language. Um, so you could think of Zapotec similar to like What's a good example of this? Um, so, okay. So I know you speak Russian. Duh. So, <laughs> yep. So a good example of what this would be like is if you go from um, Macedonia and you just travel town by town all the way up to M Moscow, as you stop out at those different towns, you're going to hear different versions of Slavic. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with Zapotec is there's so much variation, but yet similarities that it's kind of one family, but well, one language with 50 sub languages. Now, 
help me understand here, and I realize that I may not even understand the answer, but when we say language, sublanguage, and dialect, mm -hmm. how, how are those differentiated in with, with real lingui ling real linguists? So that's a very tricky thing to say. Um, you know, there's a famous saying by a um, Jewish linguist that a language is simply a dialect with an army and a navy. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to remember that. That, yes. that might be the high point. That that was awesome. Yep, and I see that my uh, my friend here just put that in there too. Oh, um, perfect. Now now I have a written record. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. That's yep. awesome. Yep, it was uh, supposedly given at a um, language symposium um, done by like the Yiddish Book Center, I believe, is where it was first said, like in the 1950s. But as far as a linguist is go, uh, as far as linguists go, the way that we classify a language is something called mutual intelligibility meaning how easy is it for two speakers to understand one another? Okay, that makes sense, because, you know, I, I speak Russian, uh, but I spend time in Ukraine, and when someone's speaking Ukrainian, I can almost understand them, right? I can pick out words, and if they're speaking slow enough, I, I can get their meaning, right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't follow, like, detailed instructions, but I could get the general gist of what they're saying. Right, uh, exactly. So would those be considered... Uh, again, according to a linguist, right, uh, in that country, they're definitely considered two different languages. But would right. those be considered dialects of one macro language or so how they would, would a linguist be, classify that? So we, we tend to like to use the term um, variety, language variety, as a way to avoid the stigma that comes with the term dialect um, and stuff like that. But... What we do know is that if you look at the standard language, so the language that's taught in school, they are different, um, different languages. But if you go, again, village by village, you'll find that you're slowly shifting from Russian to U Ukrainian. And then at the far extreme points, that's where you have trouble. But so... in the middle is just like this huge mismatch of something that we call a dialect continuum. Okay. Uh, I have to ask, because you referred to the stigma of dialect. I'm actually not aware of much of a stigma behind the word dialect. Uh, is, is there a stigma associated with dialects? Yes. Um, this is especially common among indigenous languages. Um, these, you know, colonial powers uh, during the age of colonization would go in and call these languages that are very, very unique dialects as a way to disparage its use. So for example, you know, I'm, I was born in Utah and you were too. And there's a stigma associated with the Utah dialect, we could say. And that if someone says, oh, you speak Utah, it's usually derogatory um, in some way. And it's like, oh, you should be speaking proper English. It's like, well, I, it's, proper, <laughs> it's like, well, it's proper for the variety I speak it may not be proper according to the standardized form, but, but there's, it's a way to um, degrade, dehumanize these populations. And it's especially prevalent in these vast colonial empires. Wow. Russia, uh, for example, a lot of the Russian speaking areas, the indigenous languages are called dialects um, as a way to minimize the value of these languages. You see that also here in, yep. And as my friend said, there's nothing superior about standard varieties at all. It's just, a weird fluke that happened. One one variety just happened to become more popular. But like in Mexico, for example, if you call a lot of these indigenous languages that have been spoken there for tens of thousands of years are called dialects or dialecto. 
and it's a very negative connotation and people are made fun of for speaking these indigenous languages that quite frankly have been here a heck of a lot longer than Spanish has. Oh man. I, I, I had never considered the, the socioeconomic political ramifications of dialects. I just thought they were, Mm -hmm. yeah, more like variations uh, on a theme. I hadn't thought about them being a lesser thing. Yeah, at least that's that's how people use it um, in okay. a lot of these communities as a way to degrade these languages. And because of that, these languages are disappearing. Okay, so teach, educate us. So we, we don't say dialects. He's bad. Yep. What, what do we say? Do we say varieties or sub-languages? Mm-hmm. I, I would just say varieties. Language varieties, I think, would be. Variety. So not a dialect of Russian, but a variety of Russian. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, people in this village, they speak a variety of Russian that is largely influenced by their proximity to you, you know, to the Ukrainian center of culture. Right. For instance. Exactly. Because right, I've been thinking about a town called Sumi that I visited, and they speak with such a strong Ukrainian accent. It was very difficult for me to understand them in the beginning, but now I see that as a linguistic variety mm-hmm. of Russian. Am I, am I, am I getting there? Yeah, you're getting there. Excellent. Excellent. Proud of myself. Uh, <laughs> now, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Okay. Now, I, I realize that these might be very specialized, and so you might not know, but as, as long as we have a linguist here, we're, we're at least going to make the attempt. Okay, uh, let's so do the it. first one, uh, we have a question from Tom that asks if you have any take on Hungarian. Do you have any uh, uh, history or knowledge there? Because I have some Hungarian speakers in my family, and that is a weird language, at least according to me. Uh, I would say it's fascinating and really, really cool. Now, for the, I'll talk real quick to the audience. For those that don't know, Hungarian is kind of what I would describe as like a language island. It is part of a language family that is uh, unique. It is uh, it, it is unaffiliated, unassociated with all the language families surrounding it. Uh, Correct. Largely because of the, uh, and again, you can correct my history. I imagine you've looked into this more than I have, but I think of it like a, a an ocean washing up on a beach and then washing back, but leaving behind a, a puddle, a, a tide pool of sorts, where you had this uh, Hun invasion that kind of came and then left, but left behind this this center, Hungary. Uh, am, am I close on my history? Well. <laughs> that, that That's a no, folks, in case anyone was wondering. Uh, um. As from from what I understand and from what I've studied, um, Hungarian was the result of the invasion during the, if I remember right, the 14 and 1500s um, AD um, by the Magyar, um, which is the Hungarian term for Hungarian. A Magyar. Uh, it's pronounced yep. with a D. Uh, and, I know that much well, because I've got uh, my, my Hungarian speaking brethren. Uh, well, technically, it's not a D, but it's a close approximation for uh, us it's, English speakers. It's, it's because, close as I could get. Yeah, it's it's a sound we don't actually have. It's a k k. It's like a k k. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, I know that from speaking Russian. That sometimes we just have, you know, they have sounds that we don't have, and we have mm-hmm. sounds that they don't have. Uh, one of my funnest things was trying to teach Russians to say th, you know, the theta. Yep. Yep. Uh, they, they just don't have that sound. And so it was weird to try to describe how to make that sound. And that's largely like, you, you study that, don't you? Like these yep. these sounds, yep. uh, these phonemes. Now, um, we, we had another question. Oh, sorry. You know what? Let's finish up with the Hungarian, though. You said it was fascinating. Yes. What is fascinating about Hungarian? Well, Hungarian is fascinating because... Its closest relatives are in Finland and also in the 
spoken around the Ural Mountains in Russia. Um, and so they migrated, they were part of these migrating tribes during the mid medieval ages that came, conquered that area and settled. Um, and it took linguists hundreds of years to figure out that it was related to Finnish. Uh, Finnish is uh, probably its most well-known cousin, um, Finnish followed by Sami and Estonian. And Latvian, yes. Sami, where, where is Sami spoken? So Sami is spoken up. Um, it's was formerly known as uh, the people who speak it. So the Sami uh, were formerly known as uh, Laps or the Laps. Uh, so this is spoken up in the up near the Arctic Circle in Scandinavia. So Sweden, Norway, and Finland. So the northern half of these uh, countries is where the Sami people live. Okay. All right. All right. Well, um, the other question that we had on here, uh, we have one from uh, my friend Ron. This, mm -hmm. And again, you, you may or may not know anything about this, uh, but again, we, we have a linguist here, so we're, we're going to give this a shot um didn't J.R.R. tolkien write the lord of the rings so he could make up languages because he was a philologist other way around um he created the lord of the rings to house the languages he had invented um tolkien is probably one of the more famous more famous linguists um and a philologist, for those who don't know, is a the term that's used in Britain for a historical linguist. Okay, so he, he was kind of a historical linguist. Do, do you know any details? Like what sort of, I mean, again, I hear historical linguist, I think language paleontologist. Mm -hmm. Do you know what languages he was, he was drawing from for his languages? Yes. Um, so, for example, uh, Quenya um, was modeled off of Finnish, so Hungarian's cousin. Um, Sin, uh, Sindarin um, was modeled after Welsh. Um, but he created these languages, um, and he'd been creating languages for decades um, before he even put pen to paper. Um, um, he also, as a linguist, he was primarily interested in the old Germanic languages. So old English, which was spoken about 1000 AD and, or CE, as we tend to say in the uh, academic circle. Um, and old Norse. Um, he was a specialist on old Norse and old English. All right. Uh and there's actually a funny story too um, associated with him that often what he would do for the start of his lectures, um, like the first day of class, um, because he was also a professor at Oxford, is he would dress up as an Anglo-Saxon and chart and like barge into the room with all of his students and start reciting Beowulf in Old English, just belting it at the top of his vo at the top of his lungs. As Beowulf should be. Uh, it is. Recited. And it is really fun to listen to in Old English. Um, if you ever get a chance, please do. I'll put that on the bucket list. Listen to Beowulf shouted at me in Old English. Yeah, there's a few good websites. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. And so he would come in shouting at them in Old English, reciting Beowulf. Yep. Uh, was that just to uh, assert dominance as professor or was uh... it was a way to, well, because most of these classes were on old English. And so it was a way to get the students to wake up and also to get them prepared to start studying old English. Now, let me just ask this on behalf of the people watching at home. How close is modern English to old English. Would we be able to pick out some words and get the general gist or 
Not even close. Not even close, actually. Um, we might be able to pick out a few words. Um, in fact, I have an audio sample here that... Excellent. Actually, I'm going to try and recite it. I'm not very good with Old English. I'm better with Middle English, but that's okay. So I'm just going to recite the first two lines of Beowulf, and let's see how much you understand. Nice. What we gardena in yardagum, theod kuninga frim yafronon, hutha etholengas, and then fremadon. Uh huh. Uh, th- those were words. I could yes. tell absolutely that those were indeed distinct words, probably with some sort of meaning. Uh, okay. But that's English for you. So that that's that's old English. Mm-hmm. Spoken roughly around 1000 CE, 1000 AD. Okay, so we we would not have understood that in the slightest. Nope. We, we'd have better luck with Middle English, which is about 1400. Okay, so that'd be like Columbus era. Yep. So this would be like, a, for those who study English literature, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, um, John Wycliffe, um, that, that would be that era. So a little bit after, or let's see, you would have been, what, a couple hundred years still until Shakespeare? Um, About 200 years. Yeah. Okay. Which I know still people struggle with Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But still 200 years seems like uh, not that long. How fast does language change? It changes remarkably fast and remarkably slow um, at the same time. So... As an example, so if we go just 400 years from Beowulf to Geoffrey Chaucer, so this was written about 1420, if I remember right. This is uh, from the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Okay. One that I pray with the shore salta, the draught of March hath pierced to the rota. And bathed every vein in sweet lacor, of which vertu engendered is the floor. Juan Zephyrus ek with his sweet breath, inspired hath in every halt and haith. The tender cropus and the younger sona hath in the ran, is half corsirona. So it's okay. a little bit more understandable. I was about to say, I actually caught some, some words there. I caught breath and hearth at very least. Pretty mm-hmm. sure those were. Uh, the words, okay, so yeah, I, I'm I'm picking out a few words there, and so that was just 400 years from Beowulf, where I understood nothing, to Chaucer, where I I could at least pick out some, and I imagine if I saw it written, I, I bet I could pick out even more. Yes. Okay, and then 200 years after Chaucer, we get Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. And ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack, at least we'll die with harness on our back. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Much more understandable. So, I mean, that seems like a huge jump from Middle English to to Shakespeare. Did something happen in those 200 years? A lot of stuff happened, actually. Um, One of the big things that happened were migration to the large cities in England. Um, because prior to that, you know, most people just stayed in the same town that they lived in and that their grandparents lived in, their great grandparents and so on and so forth for generations. So there wasn't a lot of mobility and there wasn't a lot of moving. Um, at least this is the hypothesis that people posit is that it was due to human migration from outlying settlements to big city centers that drove a lot of this change. Now, was this all of these uh, people from the country uh, absorbing the language in the cities, or was it them influencing, or, or both? Was it just kind oh, of a, a, was a kind mixing? Of it was a mixing. Okay, because I'll admit, yeah, 200 years from Chaucer to Shakespeare, that, that seems like a very, very big change as far oh, as yeah. how the language actually sounds. Are other languages changing just as much, just as fast? Yeah, 
there are quite a few. Um, it's especially common among languages that are not written down, uh, which is the vast majority of the world's languages. I mean, yeah, I, I think we're probably in the couple hundreds for languages that are actually written. Um, the vast majority are only oral. Um, mm -hmm. And those, and it's, some people claim that they change a lot faster. Um, and at least that's what's been observed and what's been claimed. Um, so if the language I, isn't written down, it changes a lot faster. I, if, I believe that in a second. Yeah, if languages are written down, they tend to fossilize and the evolution of those languages are slowed. Um, you can see this with Icelandic, for example. Icelandic is remarkably similar to Old, e um, old English. And in fact, there's a lot of similarities there. And there's a claim, well, if you read in the old sagas, um, if you read in the old sagas where they say, oh, the people in, in Iceland and Norway and England all speak the same language uh, because they were so close to one another, they were able to understand each other relatively well. So what kept Icelandic or did Icelandic just go down its own path or did it stay more around Old English? Did they it, write it down there and theirs kind of fossilized there or what would happen? So it fossilized. Um, they were some of the earliest writers um, um, in the Germanic group. Um, they started writing um, in the like 1000 when Christianity was introduced to Iceland and they, and it also helps that they lived on an Island um, um, that was very isolated. Not, um, not as much of this, this mixing pod of all these other people yep. coming in. Okay. Got it. Yep. And uh, their culture also helped. Um, there's a, one of the claims is that one of the reasons why is every year they would all gather together at the all thing and recite the law. And so, so everyone all thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is the assembly. Um, okay. All thing just means all the people um, and is the oldest and earliest democracy. Um, and I Iceland is actually half on the American continent. So there is a claim by the Icelanders that they have the oldest democracy in America. Well, all oldest, right. oldest, uh, representational form of government. Nice. Now, um, your, we had another question in the chat uh, about Zapotec. Is mm -hmm. it written down and fossilized a little bit, or is it still oral? And if so, is it also still in that state of evolution and change? So it is primarily an oral language. Um, the variety that I speak, um, the only people who know how to write it are linguists who study it. Um, the variety I study is called Santiago de Chopa Zapotec, which is spoken in the town of Santiago de Chopa and has about 1,200 speakers. Um, the only people no. who know how to write it are me and like 10 other linguists. What uh, what alphabet do you use to write it? Uh, we use the Latin um, alphabet. Is that sufficient? I know the Latin alphabet is a, a little bit limiting. So luckily, um, some of the sounds are able to be transcribed um, using the Latin orthography. However, there's quite a few sounds that we've had to repurpose certain letters of the alphabet to be able to transcribe sounds that don't exist in Spanish or English. Um, and so we've had to repurpose letters like, for example, J, um, the letter J we've repurposed to represent a sound that is probably a voiced uvular fricative. Um, Words. Yes. <laughs> So it's a sound that's pronounced using the uvula and it's a fricative, meaning that there's 
raspy, uh, there's this raspiness associated with it. So for example, the word for yesterday is nehe. And it's this sound that's kind of kind of similar to like um, in Russian, the the ha. The ha. Yeah. But it's pronounced further back. Really? Even further back than the ha. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Now, I hate to be that guy, but we have an opportunity here for the people watching this live stream to hear a language only spoken by 1,200 other people. Will you please say something for us in Zapotec? In your, I, I forgot the full thing, but the Santiago. La Chopa. La Chopa. Zapotec. Zapotec. Okay. Sure. Um, let me let me try. Shnia di jejun. Shnia di jejun. Which is. I speak Zapotec. Now, I didn't hear anything that sounded like Zapotec in there. What do they call their own language? Um, so the variety that I study, they say Dijajun. Dijajun? Yep. Um, tones are a little off, but... Uh, I've no okay. doubt. I've no <laughs> doubt that my tones are atrocious. Uh <laughs> yeah. Um, Zapotec's a tonal language, similar to Chinese. Oh. Okay. So all right. I, so if I you say the tone wrong, if you yeah, if you say the tone wrong, um, you could have some problems. Like for example, there's a word of uh, three words, four words that change depending on the tone and what sort of vowel you're using. Okay. So. I'll admit, I, I had not expected to find a tonal language in Mexico. Uh, that's probably my own prejudices, my linguistic prejudices, thinking that the tonal languages are mostly in the Orient. Uh, um, uh, most of them are um, in the Far East. Um, however, the Americas are full of tonal languages. Um, for example, the language family Ottomangian, which is what Zapotec is part of, the entire family is tonal. Um, every single one of the different languages spoken in this language family is 100% tonal. You also find it with a lot of the indigenous languages spoken here in the United States as well. So Navajo is tonal. Um, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota are all tonal as well. Um, so there's also a lot of languages down in, um, uh, Brazil and South America that are also tonal. Now I, I have to ask because, you know, obviously most of the indigenous languages in, uh, Mexico and down into Latin America were strongly influenced. We'll, we'll use that word strongly, uh, by Spanish, but... Mm -hmm. I think it how when, when you have a, a whole different basis, right, of a tonal language, did they stay mostly separated from that, or were they also strongly influenced by the Spanish? So the Spanish influence was very, I guess you would say, was more limited for the people of Oaxaca until the Spanish Revolution um, at the end of... World War II, uh, World War One, uh, so around the 1920s, 1930s. Um, that recently. Uh huh. That's when, I mean, you still had Spanish loan words. Um, my friend Maya, who's in the chat, um, the one that she loves the most is um, "cuch," which is "pig," which comes from "cuchino," um, and that's something that she does as she's looking into the loan word how Spanish loanwords are processed in Zapotec and what sort of changes go on there when someone is speaking Zapotec but have these Spanish loanwords. Um, it's really fascinating. But yeah, it was only really fairly recently that Spanish, like a lot of Spanish started to be seen in Zapotec. Um, and in fact, it's actually led to 
the extinction of many Zapotec languages. And we're still seeing that today. So that uh, was going to be my next question. Is it kind of crowding it out now? It is. Um, there's, un unfortunately, um, one of the biggest culprits is actually the school system. Um, that in these schools, children are forbidden from speaking their native language. Um, and this was more common during the earlier part, but they were severely beaten if they spoke their indigenous language. Um, there's stories of people who were whipped um, and yelled at, physically beaten in front of all the other students for speaking their native language. Oh man, um, how, how long ago was this? Um, let's see. There is a linguist who is Zapotec. Um, she, her family um, comes from a town of San Jeromino. Um, I can't, I can't remember the rest of the town's name, but San Jeromino in Oaxaca. And it's her grandparents. So her grandparents went through this what would you call it? A, a linguistic purging? A uh, linguistic genocide. Is linguistic what I would say. genocide. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. That's it's dark, man. It's real dark. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, that's quite common for a lot of these minority languages. Um, the U.S. Was, was guilty of it, too, with the Indian schools. I have heard some of those stories. Yeah. But we'll, uh, if you're interested, please look it up. We'll try and keep this uh, more happy. <laughs> uh, we are actually down to our last uh, five minutes or so. Um, and I feel like we don't really have the time to jump into anything more really meaty. Mm -hmm. uh, but any other just cool things about linguistics that most people don't know? Yeah, so... There's a lot of, there's a lot of really cool things depending on, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. See, and I find most things really, really fascinating, but yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to pin it down, but I think for me, the funnest thing, because I'm a phonologist is understanding how speech sounds, they're stored in the brain in a certain way, but yet they're not pronounced that way all the time. Um, I think that's one of the coolest things. Um, I guess an example of this would be the sound uh, T. The sound T in our brain, we picture a T when we hear that sound. But it actually has like five different pronunciations depending on where it is in a word and what's going on around it. So, I mean, it, is there a an alphabet out there that can capture all of these sounds or do we just do like you were doing with Zapotec and just kind of repurpose existing alphabets? Is there one like mega alphabet out there with 500 letters that can actually capture all this? So there is one alphabet that we use as linguists. Um, it's called the international phonetic alphabet. Um, though more accurately, we should call it the international phonemic alphabet, but it's already, it's already been named. It's been that way for a hundred plus years. So we'll stick with the international phonetic alphabet or IPA. Um, it was developed as a way for linguists to accurately transcribe as many of the world's languages as possible. And new symbols are being added all the time. Um, most recently, 2005. 2005, they added new ones. Mm-hmm. And there's likely to be more where we're discovering new phonemes. Yep. As we go out and study these languages that are un undocumented, um, we're able to go in and study them and we tend to find new sounds, um, especially as we start moving away from Europe, um, as we move into Africa and Papua New Guinea, which are some of the most densely linguistically dense areas of the world. You know, Papua New Guinea has almost a thousand languages spoken on that island alone. Oh my. 
I had no uh, idea. Yeah. And in Africa, easily too, about 1,000 to 1,500 languages spoken on the continent of Africa. That, that makes a bit more sense with all the, the space and the indigenous languages and things like that. But I had, yeah, that Papua New Guinea thing kind of throws me a little bit. Uh, yeah. Cause yeah, that's feel like you'd run into a new language every fifth person. Pretty uh, much. <laughs> I understand the Philippines are also quite linguistically diverse. It is. Yeah. It's um, quite dense um, there. Um, almost every island has its own Filipino language or, yeah. Now, now I have to ask, like with biologists, if you discover a new species, right, the, that's, a, that's a big deal. That's a feather in your cap. For field linguists, is that like a, a badge of honor? Like, hey, guys, I, I discovered a new sound. Um, yeah. Um, and for some linguists, it's actually discovering a brand new language that's never, that people didn't know about um that actually happened oh like a year or two ago um somebody was doing field work on a language in i believe it was malaysia and they come and they always thought that oh there was only one language spoken here but then suddenly they're like wait a minute that's a completely different language i've never heard that before and like they started researching it and no one had ever heard of this language before in academia I mean, you know, there's people speaking it, so of course people had heard of it, but yeah, people are making discoveries of brand new languages, um, new sounds, new ways of organizing language. I feel like we're coming full circle back to where we started here when you, when you talked about in the beginning that there's like nearly 7,000 languages on earth and we only know about, yeah, maybe a tenth of them. Uh, so yeah language hunters out there and then you're you're sorting out all the the phonemes and the syntax and all that yes yep excellent excellent well that's awesome um now real quick normally we talk a little bit more about you as a person we never quite got around to that right? we never this, did this was this was all linguistics so let me just at least try for a small one what got you into linguistics? Were you always interested in languages as a child, or was this a, a a sharp turn for you? So I had always been fascinated with language growing up as a kid. Um, I was that weird kid who would always go check out books about language um, and try and learn it. So I tried to teach myself Latin. I tried to teach myself Arabic, Cantonese, um, Irish. Now, how little are we talking um, L little Michael trying to learn his first language. How how old is that? I would say it was probably first or second grade. <laughs> wow. And it was, um, well, actually, no, it was earlier than that. Because my parents put me in like Spanish programs uh, to try and help me learn Spanish as a kid. Um, so that would have been preschool is when I started with Spanish. But um the first one that I remember trying to learn was Cantonese because I had a friend growing up who was Cantonese and I wanted to try and speak with him and his family in Cantonese. Um, never able to learn it though. Um, but um, so I had always tried, but I would say the thing that really cemented me was when I lived in Germany. Um, prior to that, I had thought, oh, okay, I'm going to do, I love math. I love science. So I'm going to do like physics or chemistry or mathematics um, for my career. Um, but when I was living in Germany as a missionary for my church, I was exposed to so many different languages because Germany is the crossroads of Europe and the old world. Um, that's the term that people like to use for it. And a lot of times as a missionary, we would go into the um, Ausländerheim, uh, which are the foreign homes for people who are seeking asylum in Germany. And I would just walk through and I would hear hundreds of different languages. I sat down one day and I counted up every single language that I had come across um, while I was living in Germany. And it was about 120 different languages that I had come across. And wow. it just blew my mind. I'm like, 
how is there that much diversity? How is it that all of us are able to speak language? What are the commonalities? And from there, I'm like, okay. Linguistics is my calling. I came home. This is it. And I enrolled at University of Utah, um, got my bachelor's there. And then I'm like, you know what? I need to know more. So (laughs) then I got my master's at UNC. Um, I'm actually finishing up my second master's here um, this year and then getting my PhD here as well. How do you got your bachelor's, two masters under your belt? Well, and one and a half. Down the barrel of a uh, of a doctorate. Yeah. Nice, nice, very impressive, Michael. Uh, and it was great having you on. Yeah, uh, it was good seeing you again. Indeed, uh, it was it was good talking to you. Yeah. And uh, uh, thank you for everybody who joined us. I uh, hope you had fun. Hope you learned something. I certainly did. Uh, there's going to be a lot of research going on right after the show because I have some things I got to follow up on myself. Uh, all right. Next week, uh, we're actually, uh, I'm told that it's going to be on Friday. Okay. Uh, so we have had another small change. It's usually on Thursday. We're going to have next week's on Friday, also 6 30. Yes, also 6 30. Uh, Mike will be back. Uh, the, the other Mike, Mike Forsyth, <laughs> not Mike Brinkerhoff. Uh, and we're going to be talking about crazy writers. Uh, anyone awesome. who's ever been, anyone who's ever been friends with a writer knows that they're just a little bit off. And boy, I tell you what, in history there are some fascinating writers. And so we're going to be discussing the history of crazy writers. So uh, join us then. Remember to. A like and comment, but most of all, subscribe uh, so you don't miss out on them. And we'll see you next week. Thank you all so much. Have a good one, everyone. Appreciate you.